Okay, does this look right to everyone? Yep. Fine. Okay, thank you, Mark Andre, for your introduction. Also, a very warm welcome from my side, from Dresden. Uh, by the way, I studied in Aachen, so I'm originally from Aachen, and I'm now in Dresden for more than 20 years. And a great deal of that time I actually spent on developing Vampir. These days, I'm no longer developing this, the tool by myself, but I, well, actually became more a user of it, which well, this slight different role um, gives me a different picture also on the stuff. And today I will, of course, focus on the user side of it. Okay, my talk today is um, subdivided into two parts. I will try to roughly spend the first, the first 45 minutes with um, the tool itself, how it works, how it looks like, um, the bells and whistles it has, not all of them for sure. Um, I will stick to the cases that you can actually use it in, um, the mission itself. Um, I will, towards the end, briefly talk about um, Vampir in its different flavors because there's also a server approach of it. Um, but most of the time I will spend with um, the displays and what they can do for you. And in the second part, actually, I will then um, come to examples that I picked from my daily work in order to show you how I use it more or less. And of course, they are sort of non-representative because of course you see the, the issues I found, but um, this information can be, I think, easily translated um, towards your problems you probably have in your daily life. Okay. The mission of Vampire. Um, the goal of it is actually to visualize uh, the dynamics of complex parallel processes. So it is not by definition limited to MPI, to OpenMP, things like that. It originally came from MPI. That's where the MPI from Vampire actually stands for, um, visualization and analysis of MPI resources originally. But these days it basically deals with many of the programming paradigms that are available for HPC computers. It requires actually, and that was already, I think set by Mark and Ray already, um, it consists of two components. It needs SCORE-P as recording infrastructure and the browser and the visualization itself, that is actually a part that officially is called Vampire. Um, sometimes people combine that. So, but keep that in mind, you always need SCORE-P to record the data, to monitor your application, and then when it comes to visualization and analysis of the data, you use Vampire. So what are the typical questions that you would want to address with Vampire? Many of my customers or the problems I see myself basically deal around the question, what actually happens in my application during, ex during execution at any given point in time? on a process or a thread or on a GPU. The next question always, or is often like, hmm, the communication patterns that I programmed, do they actually behave the way I think they behave in reality or is there something that I missed? And for example, the order of messages is different than I expect and um, the network behaves differently compared to what I expect, things like that. And when it comes to parallel computing, many of the questions or the core problem, at least from my point of view, relates to imbalance or balance in general. It does not only refer to load imbalance or load balance, but also other resources like IO or the memory access patterns that you implemented or that, that your application is using, is using actually might somewhat be imbalanced. And because of that, um, the overall performance of the application is not as expected. Event trace visualization. That's what we are talking here about. Um, in Vampire, what does that mean? It basically means that whenever you look at the recorded data that comes from score P, 
when you set the right switches is by default actually displayed in a time series way. Show, so it shows actually the application activities and the communication along the time axis. So whenever you use Vampire, this is what comes up first. You see this, this timeline, you see the time that was spent in, in your application, and you see this kind of colorful pattern here. Um, that's kind of standard in timeline-based tools, so we are not the only ones using that. On the vertical axis, it's typically um, the processing element, in this case, the MPI processes that are depicted, but it can also be other stuff like here where we just stick to a single process um, or other entities. But mostly on the left-hand side, it's at least in Vampire, it's the, I would say the resource that is doing something over time. So uh, the master timeline, as you can see it here, I will come to that later on a few, bit more in detail. It mostly reveals the processes and the threats. When you stick to a single process, the pictures look, look um, slightly different. And you can also think of hardware counters like are depicted here. It's like a, a stock exchange rate or something like that. Um, in Vampire, we have many displays that basically are designed around this kind of, um, yeah, pattern, so timeline and PE. Um, most prominent ones, among many more actually, are the master timeline, which comes up by default. And the other ones here, they actually only show up on demand, but I will come to that later on. Um, core point is that this is the first thing to know in Vampire, timelines. The second thing is um, the summary charts, we call them. It's actually something or very similar to what you all knew from, know from Excel. Um, you basically get quantitative results aggregated for certain metrics. In this particular case here on the right-hand side, it's very basic. It just shows you how much time is spent overall in MPI um, and in some other groups in, your, in this particular example of your code. So that's rather unspectacular. Um, we have many more of these statistics. Here on the right-hand side, you basically deal around the function summary, which means that you get an idea of your um, function statistics, the functions, the methods that you wrote in your code, and basically you get timings and things like that, like you might already know from profilers in general. They do the same thing, we just do it here, um, just for completeness actually, because it's more important in Vampire to deal with the timelines that I presented earlier. Of course, we have similar displays for message statistics, for single processes, um, for the communication overall from um, one peer to another, but I will come to that soon. What you have to keep in mind from these two slides is basically, basically that we deal with two kinds of visualization, either aggregated in summary charts or event-wise in timeline charts. When you want to use Vampire, um, I think Bernd pointed that out during his last presentations as well. Um, you basically have to deal with three points or you have to do three things. First, instrument your application with Score P. That's the monitoring infrastructure. Um, it's installed, I think, on, on many of the HPC systems. So normally it's just loading the module, prefixing your make files, ideally with uh, the Score P wrapper. And that's pretty much it. Then in the second step, you run your application with an appropriate test set. What does that mean, an appropriate test set? Well, Bernd already pointed that out during his presentation. I checked that. Um, dealing with event-based visualization requires lots of events and records a lot of events. Um, we're typically dealing with millions and even many more. Um, this requires also quite some memory. And this can become a bottleneck either in main memory while you're recording or later on in your file system. So here, appropriate test set means 
make it small, your application run with respect to the problem size, with respect to um, the resources, the CPU resources you want to use, the number of processes, and with respect to the runtime. So as short as possible, as long as necessary. Because of course you have to do it in a, you have to run things in a way that later on will show you the actual problems. If you have a case that is small, but doesn't show you the problem we are looking for, it doesn't help. Okay, so appropriate means as small as possible and um, as long as necessary with regarding the resources. And then the third part, of course, um, you fire a vamp here, you recorded an OTF file, OTF2 file, by score P, and now you actually have two choices. Um, the first one would be, if you have a small trace file, you basically can fire up either vamp here locally on your desktop, when you have converted or you move the trace file, or you do it on a, a remote machine, on an HPC machine with um, screen forwarding. When you're dealing with um, larger trace files, so you recorded a pretty large application, for example, a pretty large run, then you might run out of um, storage with the local incarnation of Vampyr. For that purpose, we have a Vampyr server, which is basically um, the analysis engine extracted from Vampyr, translated into an MPI program and running on your HPC system like your application does. This is pretty similar to what we know from um, Skalaska, but here it is interactively and after the program was actually run. So we first record the data and then we look at the data. data. Good. So those are the basics. Um, I said on this slide, instrument replication with SOP. Actually, it is pretty simple, but when it comes to tracing, there are a few things that are related to the resources that I mentioned earlier that you need to take care of. I think that's a standard approach that is um, explained throughout SCORP and Scalaska. Usually you start with a profile. That means you use SCORP in profile recording mode, which like a normal profiler simply records aggregated information for you. This typically ends up in a table where you see how many processes you have, which functions were called, how much time is spent in those functions, and so forth. For tracing, we can use this information to actually estimate with SCORP score, that's a command line tool, part of SCORP, to estimate the size of a full program trace. So if we would rerun your program like we did it for the profiling session, and um, with tracing enabled, SCORP score will basically show you how many gigabytes or terabytes of storage you need to actually create this trace. This is very handy because um, usually by default, there is unfortunately, but this is a, related to the approach that we are using, there's typically too much information recorded, which in tracing becomes critical. So whenever you do the next step, which means to run your application, you need to create a filter to exclude typically very fine grain calls. Imagine a C++ code that uses a lot of template programming and uses lots of very fine grain methods. They would all be recorded one by one per timestamp. And this is simply, for this approach, too much. Um, as I said, with SCORP score and the profile results, you can easily create such a filter and check this filter impact with respect to data reduction, um, again, with SCORP score. And when you end up with um, an estimation of a few terabytes, no, not terabytes, gigabytes usually, um, although terabytes are possible, you're fine. Your filter is doing fine and you can use that filter for running your application and enabling the tracing with the environment variable score P enabled tracing equals true. And you might have noticed point E, optionally, you can actually even recompile your code with this particular filter 
and remove the instrumentation for those functions. That is not mandatory, but it actually saves you not only memory, like the runtime filter would do as well, but it also removes the instrumentation entirely, which saves you runtime overhead. So that's a good thing to do. Once you've done that, you continue with step two of the previous slide and you're ready to fire up Bumpier. And this is actually not what you see when you fire up Bumpier for the first time. It is actually a screenshot that gives you an overview of the most prominent charts that are available in the Vampire GUI. And so normally when you come up um, the first time with uh, the tool, it's easier to, to look at the data. And I will come to that in a second. We will start up with the master timeline. What is the master timeline? I used that name a couple of times now. It provides you detailed information about functions, communication, and synchronizations um, for a collection of processes in an overview manner, I would say. And this is how it looks like. And this is actually how Vampire comes up by default when you first start it with a new trace file. What do we see? Um, first of all, this part here, that is really the master timeline. Um, you have the time axis, as I presented earlier. You have the processes. And you have this color encoding. And this color encoding basically means what your application does over time when it runs. On the right-hand side, you see an encoding of this um, color theme. This encoding actually refers to um, your application. So when you have an application that has these modules and this kind of instrumentation, um, you see those colors. Uh, this is not strictly um, encoded by Vampire itself. It partly comes from your application. So it is application dependent. Um, things like MPI, they are typically in red. So other stuff like IO can be in green or today it is actually in yellow and things like that will show up. So that gives you an overview of this code here in particular. And um, if you look at the time before 10 seconds, this looks very much like initialization step. So this is how the application fires up. And then you see these regular patterns here. This is typically um, in a regular application the iterations that the application walks through. Up here on top, you see um, a summary of the overall one. You see that this color pattern is actually very similar to what you see in the master timeline. And when I zoom in details here now, you basically will see that up here, you won't see any difference. So the idea is to always maintain this picture of the overall one while you can actually here in this region, zoom in and check the details. If you look here to the left-hand side, you get basically um, a few icons that let you add further charts to this particular display. So if I would, for example, click on this button, I would see the process timeline popping up and we will come to the other icons in a few minutes. Okay, so what happened here? We basically changed the bars, um, the, the, the height of the bars so that we get to see more details. So we have a scroll bar on the right-hand side. We no longer see all the processes, but now only those who fit into this particular vertical area. And what I do now basically is my first zoom in step. Um, and I said earlier that the initial phase of the program is roughly 12 seconds. And this is what happens in those 12 seconds. You actually see here very nicely that process zero obviously does things differently than compared to the others. This is very normal because in many cases, the first rank does the initialization, reads configuration files and things like that, and propagates this information to the other ranks, which is actually happening here. Those black lines here, um, they represent collective and peer-to-peer -peer communication. And on the left-hand side, you actually see an open of uh, 
a configuration file. Let's zoom in a bit further. And this is one of the steps that broadcasts information from the initial thread from master rank or from rank zero to the others. This is what you basically see here in this time frame. So we are looking now at one second here, more or less. Zooming in even further gives you more details and gets you to the point where you see individual MPI and configuration routines. And up here, what you see now is basically that the portion we are looking at is this small portion here that you that is marked with those left and right bars here. So the rest of the stuff here to the left and to the right is currently not depicted in this big chart here. Let's zoom out again and look at the overall picture again. We will now dive into um, the iterations. So initialization phase is gone. We remove that. It's no longer depicted here, which is visible here. So the stuff we are looking at is slightly in gray here, while the rest um, maintains with its original colors. And what do we see? We basically see that we have one, two, three, four, five, six iterations, but not more actually. Um, and to see a few more details, we dive in further. So again, marking from left to right, that's how Zooming works in Vampire, very basic, um, gets you to two iterations, which are now in the order of seven seconds. Still not showing too much of this iteration, so we dive in even further by just sticking to one iteration and going in there even further so that we finally see a situation like this. And what is different now is that those big black lines that we have seen before now actually appear to be individual lines. So those individual lines here each represent a single message that was sent from A to B. So from process zero to process one, for example. If we dive in even further, we get to the point where we have enough vertical space to actually um, see the real function names, which of course are only available uh, once we have enough space. So this is now the communication pattern that was implemented here. We see a lot of MPI weight, which usually is not a good sign. So this is kind of chaotic here, um, but we'll come to that point later on when we actually analyze the application. Okay, that was the presentation or the introduction to the master timeline. Let's stick to the next one. The process timeline and the counter timeline. What are these for? Okay, this is a process timeline. You get there by clicking on this icon up here, which is depicted here in big. So what is different when compared to the master timeline? The master timeline showed all the processes that are available in your application at the same time. The downside of this is that we basically have a single bar per rank, but not more vertical space. We don't actually see the call tree like it is executed. We always see just the function or the group of functions that is currently active, but we don't see its parents, for example. Here with the process timeline, the situation is different. Now on the vertical axis, we actually see the depth of the call stack. So coming from one, which is usually main, we get to yeah further call levels. And the further we go down, we closer we get to the point of the routines that are actually active. And if you look at this picture, you again see actually that there is some initialization phase between in between the first 12 seconds. And then we get to this point where we do um, the iterations of the actual computation. The color coding is, by the way, identical. So um, like in the master timeline. So here in this particular example, MPI is red. Useful stuff from the application itself is in green. But 
also other parts of the program, which is a weather forecast, by the way, um, are highlighted in a particular color. So the person that wrote this code and did the instrumentation now knows perfectly well um, what is happening at what time of the application run. Of course, um, clicking on this icon again will reveal another process timeline, which can be switched to a different process. Doing that, we can actually now can look at two different processes and see to what degree they behave identical and to what degree they behave differently. And well, when it comes to the iterations, the pattern here and here looks very similar. So this is stuff that they are doing commonly. And when you get to the first 12 seconds, again, you see that um, process 63, which is sort of slave process, does different business when compared to process zero who does the configuration. This guy here basically waits an MPI, which is the red stuff down here, while process zero does the recording, the parsing, and those things of the configuration file. Good. Um, we can augment this information by further stuff. Um, here we basically added the so-called counter timeline, um, which is implemented so that you can actually record with score P in addition to um, this information up here, which relates to the functions that are executed. Metrics like floating point units, um, executed per second, um, the memory that was allocated, basically everything that is available as system counter that comes from Poppy or other um, metrics that are available on your system. Here in this particular example, we basically allocated the amount of memory allocated over time, which is not surprisingly rising up very quickly at the beginning. And then yeah, going up and down while actually the configuration happens. And it's pretty common that while the actual computation takes place, memory is no longer allocated anymore. So we normally stay in a pretty yeah, stable situation around a fixed memory volume. But again, this counter is just an example. It could be any other counter. And later on, we will actually see different examples like um, yeah, the floating point rates for HPC is often very important, but also memory accesses and things like that can be shown here in conjunction with um, what is actually going on in your application, function-wise and method-wise or loop-wise. And of course, this is not limited to a single one. Clicking on these here, these icons basically will add, as long as there is space, further charts. And there's also a way, of course, with this X here to remove them again. As I said, um, we have multiple metrics, not just one. Here in this particular time, um, this particular example, we added just um, the user time metric that comes from the R usage counters of the system, which basically gives you an idea um, whether your application was actually scheduled and doing something useful or whether it was waiting um, for IO or for other stuff on the system side. Okay, of course, zooming works here as well, as indicated here up here. We now just stick to one iteration again. And of course, all these um, charts here, they basically adapt to this time scale. And um, it gets you closer to what actually happens. And one step further, you get to a point where actually you can relate those graphs here to what's going on up here. So when you have an idea, for example, now we are here in this green region, you can relate that information directly to what is available here for um, process 63 with respect to the user time. So this graph goes up and down typically in a related way to the um, function state changes that we see up here. Zooming goes even further, of course, and we end up with an MPI weight here depicted here. Those individual arrows here now represent 
individual messages going out from here. So we basically guess I see um, send commands here, MPI sends. And this is typically, we could go even further into um, this, but this is normally as much as far as you want to go with, with Vampire. When you see function names, you are typically at a very um, fine grain level already and see the, yeah, the picture of your code that is true for a very small time scale, which is again depicted up here. That's only a very small portion. Good. So having said that, I will now basically come to um, the summary charts that I mentioned earlier. And I will start with the so-called function summary. It gives you actually an overview of this time of the accumulated information across all functions and for a collection of processes. Um, collection here means that you can actually decide which of those processes you want to look at. It is either all the processes or a subset. This is all configurable typically, and this is unfortunately not visible here. Um, when you, in, in such a chart, when you click on the right hand button of your mouse, um, it gives you typically a context menu where you can do all sorts of configurations for this particular chart and also change the way data is visualized. So you can do things like um, percentages or absolute numbers, filter stuff you don't want to see. And if you look at a, such a function summary only, we removed here the timelines now uh, because we did not have too much space here in this presentation. Um, you see this kind of charts. Here on the left-hand side, you get the typical standard pie, which is nice for presentations, but gives you, in this particular case, aggregated times across all MPI ranks for the individual function groups that are in your code. And you actually see that, yeah, more than a quarter is spent on MPI. The stuff, the other stuff is doing useful things. That sometimes is enough, at least for managers. When it comes to technical information, you probably also want to know what is the MPI function that actually needs most of the time. And this is done actually with the same uh, chart. They are all function summaries, but just by clicking on the right-hand side and setting this to show me all the functions individually, you get this kind of profile. And yeah, the topmost one is the MPI broadcast consuming 370 seconds overall, aggregated over all processes. And yeah, probably we should do something about that, but we will come to that in my second part of the, today's presentation. Of course, um, zooming is actually even possible here. Um, so we could do that in order to get this, but we could also do, and that's what we did actually here, change the metric that we are looking at. First of all, we had accumulated exclusive time per function, and now we switch to the number of invocations per function. So we see actually, although most of the time spent in the collective MPI call, um, a great deal of my implication does actually appear to peer communication. So we have a lot of I sends, I receives, and MPI waits here um, with respect to the number of invocations. Apparently, when it comes to time, they don't really matter. That's the good thing, because MPI broadcast is the time dominant part of it, but it only has um, a lot less calls. Good. Um, what do we see here now? Um, again, we have all processes. We have accumulated time, but this time it is exclusive time, which means show me all the time that does not include time from other calls to subroutines. And um, looking at the picture this way, it changes again, and there isn't much to say actually about this here at this point. Ah, important thing. Um, of course, the statistics that we see here um, always refer to the region, the time region that was selected up here or in the corresponding um, timeline. By the way, of course, in this chart up here, we can also drag things around. So unfortunately, this is not an interactive presentation, but of course I could in the real tool do scrolling and zooming here as well. So I could 
move this window around, everything else would adapt immediately to what I select up here. Now, what I did here basically was um, removing everything but um, the module that deals with those functions here. So the dynamic part of the simulation, the rest is now hidden in this chart here. So this kind of, yeah, information selection is also possible because sometimes when you deal with hundreds or thousands and sometimes millions of functions, probably you don't want to see them all in the same list. You just remove what you don't want to see. And yeah, this is now the same picture, but just for MPI. And what we see basically in this region, uh-huh, there is no collective at all. There are only MPI weight, I send and I receives. So the collectives, they must happen somewhere here, somewhere outside, but apparently not in here. As I said, this stuff is adjusted to the, just the time interval that we see up here. Good. Process summary. Um, what's the difference of the process summary when compared to the function summary? Huh. There's actually not much difference. It's just that this kind of chart gives you the same information as the function summary, but now again for all the processes at the same time. This is not a timeline. Be careful. That's important to say. This now is really just a summary view. So it's aggregated information. The aggregation takes place from left to right. So uh, let's say process one consumes roughly 5.5 seconds in MPI broadcast and more time in solve EM and so on. So this is aggregated now. It does not relate to the timeline at all. The nice thing about this is that you actually see nicely when you have imbalances, for example because the fact that we now have all the profiles for all the ranks um, shown at the same time, we see that a certain class behaves, for example, like um, process one to process 21, whereas 22 and 23, they have a slightly different behavior. They need more time, they spend more time in MPI broadcast, and the other stuff looks very similar. Well, does this scale well? We have 27 ranks here. No, it does not, because HPC codes have more than 27 ranks typically. And this is where it comes to the um, process summary. So what we do now basically here is clustering. We cluster the ranks that have very similar behavior um, by k-means, and we show only the ones that um, differ significantly. The color coding here on the right-hand side, this pattern is a bit confusing and it needs some explanation. First of all, it shows you how many ranks have this behavior. It's three for this behavior, eight for this behavior, two for this behavior, one guy only does this stuff here. And guess whom it is? Yes, it is process zero. This is the guy here. This is indicated by this black line at the beginning of this array here because each black line represents a rank in the MPI code. So these black lines here basically refer to um, processes, ranks close to rank one, two, three, zero, something like that. If I would click on that and that would be an interactive presentation, I would see the rank numbers, which I cannot do here right now. Um, if you actually look at this chart, you, you see that um, certain behaviors relate to um, the ranks and the rank organization. So some stuff only occurs in the ranks with high numbers. Some stuff only occurs with ranks um, with low numbers. And yeah, one particular behavior, the initialization rank, of course, only occurs for one one. Of course, you can actually also cluster with less clusters. So that would look like this. I could reduce this to two or three, but then you actually see that um, not identical behavior is mixed within the same clusters. And this is something you don't want to have typically. If you see, look at those, uh, those structures here, they actually give you an idea to what extent these bars here differ for the processes that are summarized in this line. So if this structure here is 
very small it basically means that it is not much variation if it's like that that's a bad sign so here in this particular case we have one broadcast that did not spend time at all which was clustered with um, a broadcast of a rank that yeah took significantly time so this clustering is probably not a good idea not a good idea good we are approaching the end of the overview communication matrix I think that is pretty straightforward. Again, an aggregated view on the data, which gives you the idea who actually sends information to whom and what kind of information and at what rate, for example. So in this example, we see uh, the number of messages. So we basically see that all ranks um, are sending to their neighbors um, the same amount of data which is yeah something one would probably expect for this particular code and but this can also be talked to something else uh, when it comes to the volume so not just the number of messages but the data it actually holds the message and we see that there are differences so now we basically see here by the color coding that we have something in the order of 130 megabytes towards roughly 100 megabytes that are send to the nearest neighbors. Of course, that can be altered to something else here. It's just um, now from a bandwidth perspective. So um, how much time does it actually take to transfer the data and what data rate results from that? Again, this would be done by just right clicking and setting the right metric. Good. Having said that, um, one thing I missed, that was the message summary. So before I showed you was the communication matrix, um, which showed you who sends information to whom. And here we got an aggregated view again. So this is more like a function summary, but now for messages. You see, basically, first of all, um, how many messages of what size, for example have been all sent overall for all the um, processes involved and for the overall time. So we have this particular site, roughly 15 kilobytes and the amount of messages that had this kind of size. And this goes down and gives you basically all the sizes that were exchanged and the corresponding numbers. Of course, that picture can be changed to something else. Here we have the sizes again, but then come Bind with the information of the data rate. So at what data rate was this particular message size on average and at maximum exchange over the network? Of course, one can change that to something else, which we did here. But now for just this iteration, again, as I said, we changed this picture here. We select a different interval and we get different data and adapted charts. This is just what we see here. Good. That's an important point of view. The performance radar, what is that? Um, actually, it's related to the counters that I presented right at the beginning. So it gives you, but not just one counter, but multiple counters um, for individual processes. The problem with counters is that they are typically recorded, or in many cases, per process. And if I would basically add up process charts down here, that doesn't scale. scale. So I can, cannot draw more than two or three graphs here. Um, doesn't work for hundreds of ranks. What the performance radar does, basically, it um, color codes the graph. So again, we have, in principle, just the graph here is just that Low values are now blue and high values are now red. And what we picked here was the floating point rate over time metric. And you see actually that this color coding corresponds to the activities actually taking place on the MPI ranks. So one would expect that during the initialization phase, which we already talked about, um, we don't see high floating point rates. 
for obvious reasons, because there is no computation, real computation taking place there. That changes when we come to the point where we actually have real computation simulation iterations. And you see that that is related or reflected here by the high floating point rates. Not in those areas, apparently there's no floating point or no high floating point activity in this particular part of the code when it comes from one iteration to the next iteration. Of course, this color coding here is adjustable. So you can basically use the scale down here and let's say only depict values that range between three gigaflops and four gigaflops in this particular simple example. And everything else is not shown anymore. So it becomes gray more or less. This is nice if you want to focus on certain areas or certain questions only. It depends on the problem that you're looking at. Um, I cannot say in general, you have to put it in, in a particular range. It really highly depends on uh, the data you're looking at, but it comes in very handy. Okay, what is this? This is basically a way to combine the master timeline as depicted here with this performance rate up picture. The thing is that, as I said earlier, this information relates very much. So why not put it on top of each other? And this is what you see here. It is now combined basically over each other. And with this slider, you can just, you know, translate or change the um, translucency of the performance radar. And this is what we basically do now. Um, this is not very opaque now. So we see um, the actual floating point rates. You see yellow parts, which are not very high in activity. And you see those red parts. Um, and this is basically just the floating point rate. So we don't see the structure of the program anymore. If we go back again, we see the underlying structure of the code. And this is a mixture of basically both. And of course, the adjusting of the range works as well here. Everything that um, now is within the range 2G to 3.5 gigaflops is depicted here. And the rest more or less is um, hidden or at least very transparent. You can use this, use this feature to actually do some kind of find um, in the data. If you want to see your regions in your code that either have very bad or very high performance or high numbers you're interested in, it doesn't have to be floating point rates, of course. You can actually use this as some kind of finder to get to those areas, to those positions in runtime that potentially don't behave as we expected. Good. With that, I think I will complete my introduction to all the charts. And actually, I did not present all the charts, but the most important ones in Vampire. And I want to finish my first part of this presentation, of this presentation with um, the two different modes in which Vampire can be used. This is the first mode. So um, Vampire is one program running on your local machine or in the front end node of your HPC machine, you basically have your multi-core program, MPI program, you attach score P, you run it, you produce a trace file, a single file actually of medium, small to medium size. You fire Vampire in its monolithic version. And this uses some thread parallel processes in, internally, but it's not very scalable. This is the case that works for many examples. I do that for hundreds and thousands of cores when I have a proper filter file. When it comes to the big cases where you really either record terabytes of data, which do not fit um, on, let's say, a single node anymore on your HPC system or on your uh, well-equipped uh, local system, you would use Vampire Server. And the picture changes this way. Um, you have a substantially higher parallelized code. Again, you attach score P, which is scalable, fine. And then you basically produce a collection of trace files. It's no longer a single file or a small collection. It's really a vast collection of data. And that would not work with Vampire itself. 
uh, in its GUI version and its small parallelization. It would work, however, with Vampir Server, which was in this particular example, or which would in this particular example be started as an MPI code with this command line. And then you basically use the Vampir GUI to connect, like in a web browser, to the server and use the data analytics, data analytics capabilities of this server to produce those big data volumes. Good. Let me summarize my part so far. Um, I showed you Vampire and Vampire Server. We saw how interactive trace visualization and potential analysis works. I showed you a lot of zooming and browsing, and this works well to, let's say, at least 20 terabytes of data. So far in the past, we had runs um, that worked for 200,000 processes and PEs. But I would not recommend to do that because there are waiting times involved if you do that. Normally, it's better to stick to smaller codes, smaller um, implementations, or smaller runs, shorter runs. The GUI and, and the server actually works for Linux. The GUI itself is available for Windows and Mac OS as well. And please keep in mind, um, Vampire is not a tool designed to solve your problems or automatically point you to them. It does, however, give you a full insight into the execution of your application. So having said that, um, I think we have a huge portfolio uh, where we have profilers, we have an approach like Scalaska, which does, which, does, uh, which does automatic analysis for you, but Vampire follows a different approach. It requires you being the smart yeah, engine, the smart person in front of the data. It only gives you an access point, an easy way to access this vast amount of data that is recorded in your tracing analysis, but it doesn't solve your problem. So let me conclude this part of the day. Um, performance on HPC does not come for free in HPC. That's for sure. Um, and this means can mean a lot. It doesn't mean, it means that, first of all, you don't get fast running applications, but it also means that if you're doing tracing with Vampire, you have to do some preparation, like the filtering I mentioned earlier. Um, so in order to get there, use profiling first and then do tracing, please. Don't fire up tracing from the very beginning because you will be frustrated by the huge volumes that are recorded which makes analysis complicated and might not work on the re memory resources that you have. So because of that, use tracing tools in general, but Vampire in particular, uh, with precautions, be aware of the overhead involves the recording and also the data volume that is recorded. And of course, if you have problems and features, please contact us at vampire support at zih.tbreston.de. Okay, I think I will now switch to my second slide deck where I come to examples. Now that I have shown you all the basics around the um, graphs and bells and whistles and vampire, I actually want to show you or tell you a few stories of um, what you can actually do with the tool and how this looks like and where it can actually get you um, with respect to modifications in your code and finding issues which you probably were not aware of before. So my first example is a very much standard example that we show everywhere. Nevertheless, it's a nice example, which is why I am showing it here as well. So it is actually a weather forecasting code. And this run here was performed on just 100 processes, but it's um, a number that can be easily handled in such a presentation. We could easily go beyond that, but um, then showing stuff would be more complicated for me. Good. These are just the, the numbers that we have for the code and how it is organized. And when you run it or when you ran the, the first incarnation of this example, we got this picture in Vampire. My God, what does that mean? Mm, well, just to give you an idea, uh, those black bubbles here, I named them bubbles. Um, they basically represent 
huge amounts of messages. If I would show, or if Vampire would show lines, we would basically see a black block here, uh, which doesn't work apparently. So we came up with those bubbles. They are just a compromise. They are not perfect, but what you can actually see or derive from those bubbles is that the number of messages changes um, over time. Here we have a lower rate than at the very beginning. But beyond that, it, they don't show too much actually, which is why I, at this scale, typically turn them off. What we see also is that we have a run that has almost 600 seconds. And on the right-hand side, by the way, this is the default chart view, how Vampire comes up again when you um, did not touch anything beforehand. What it shows you here basically is that um, MPI consumes quite some time. So the amount of MPI spent in this run is actually way too high when compared to the real, uh, the real work that is carried out by the application. So one would want to have this below, I don't know, 10% or something like that. And this is way more than we would expect. Now the question was, yeah, why is it like that? It shouldn't be like that. Um, this code was optimized beforehand. Um, so it's not new, it's not under development in this particular example. However, um, we have a problem here on this machine in this run. What was the problem? Okay, what do we do here now? Or what did we do basically? On the left-hand side, you still see the master timeline, but we switch from 30 processes to all 100. So we show them now concurrently, and you see that labels disappear, those bubbles disappear, because there's not vertical room, any, not enough vertical room anymore. We added one more um, statistic here. This one was the statistic time per group. We added percentages. Um, here we now basically see that really 32 percentage is spent uh, in MPI. And we toggled or altered this chart here to um, a function display. So we now see the statistics by function. And of these 32%, 23% alone is apparently spent in MPI received. Hmm. Strange. Down here, we added a different picture that somewhat summarizes this information here in a sense that it shows what part of the code or what, yeah, what regions executed, actually executed in parallel at a certain given point in time. And we see that surprisingly, MPI gets more parallel in the sense that it consumes more time in more processes towards the end of the application. That should not be the case. You would normally want it to be like this part here at the beginning, which looks very healthy. Because here we basically see that only, let's say a fraction of 10% is spent in MPI when averaged overall processes. This is what I would expect to be healthy, but this is, not clearly where we want to go. And this is actually also a good example which shows you why tracing can be helpful when compared to processing, uh, to profiling, I mean. Because in profiling, this effect would be averaged out. You would not see that it actually happens over time. And that there is a small part at the beginning, the first, let's say 120 seconds, that behaves well. Only then something changes in the code and yeah, that screws up the overall performance of the code, um, which is actually also visible here. You see at the very beginning, a lot of blue, which means good, that is um, part of the simulation. And actually the red power, which is, or the red color starts dominating like down here, also up here and towards the end, it really becomes apparent that there is way too much MPI um, in this part of the runtime of the code. Someone who is a bit knowledgeable also notices that, hey, that is strange. If you look at um, the processes between 52 and 56, they don't have this red behavior. They remain blue over the entire time. You don't see that here, but you see that in this kind of 
representation. And someone who's familiar with um, the vampire or with tracing tool in general, uh, he really normally realizes quickly, hmm, well, this could be an indication for load imbalance. Because if these guys are doing some reasonable work here and not doing MPI, um, that could mean that they are doing more work and the others simply have to wait for them. So that was our, that is typically an educated guess at this point. The question is, is this really load imbalance or what is it? What happens? This is what I said. And what we now basically do is we dive into the beginning of the code. That's where we had um, the first three iterations. And we see that we have low MPI time here. If you look at the statistics, as I said, they apply, adapt automatically at this interval. Um, we are in the order of 11%. That is probably accepted. acceptable. Um, question is, and everything looks balanced, right? So we have uh, throughout the 100 ranks, we have a very similar pattern, um, no different behavior on one of the ranks, just as it should be, I would say. Perfect. And also the MPI received, by the way, is in the order of 7%. Good. If we now look at the end of the application, like indicated up here, st things start to look different. We are now in the order of almost, well, actually above 50% MPI overlap. Gosh, that is not what you want, um, clearly. Same thing for an individual MPI receive representation. So MPI receive alone requires 37% of the time. And here it also becomes more apparent than um, at the first picture. If you look again between 52 and 56, you see here, well, we don't have MPI communication for those ranks that much. Um, that is yeah, at least a surprise. And the question now is why is that the case? Is this something that comes from the application? Is this something that comes from the outside? What is it in the application? Of course, uh, load imbalance was a guess, right? I mean, that is not uncommon. Um, the question is, why is it? And at this point, um, we had to contact the developers and the model owners because um, why can this be? I mean, why can an application run fine at the very beginning and then become so screwed towards the end? And actually, our assumption is also underlined by floating point counters, because you see for those um, processes that I meant that the floating point rates, and this is now, by the way, the performance data, um, looking at the data for the 100 ranks at the same time, you see that, OK, we have certain processes that have a high floating point in the load. And that might be the difference, or actually that is the difference for our load imbalance that we see here. And contacting the owners of the model, they actually said, hmm, yeah, that could be the case. Let's look at the data and how it is mapped to the processes. And doing that, and that's the funny point. Now, um, this is weather. And weather, of course, needs some data distribution and certain boundaries and things like that. And um, there are also local phenomena now. And what happens here is actually that at simulation time that relates to 100 second um, execution time, the sun is actually rising in the model. So this changes the, the way actually um, computational intensity needs to be performed or the computations needs to be performed. And this actually led to this imbalance. Yep, that was as simple as that. And um, the resulting clouds in this area, yeah, basically lead it then to this imbalance and um, certain stuff in the mapping had to be fixed. And with that, the stuff was gone. This sounds very easy, but um, in, in practice, yeah, one first has to get to this point because you don't see that in a profiler. 
normally. Good. We have roughly 20 minutes left, which is good. Let me tell you another story, uh, which is a somewhat newer story. Um, the example I showed you before was actually an issue that was coming from inside the application. So there was something not perfect inside the application. This particular case, the, the mapping of the module onto the processes. I will now come to an example where actually, but this is at the beginning not known, um, we see an issue that is not, not actually part of the application. Uh, you know that HPC typically takes place on a shared system. So at least um, the interconnect is typically shared, file systems as well. Um, so that's where the story begins actually. So, and I had that very recently. And it is, the story is as follows. Um, T. Dresden is involved in testing uh, the new spec HPC 2021. Uh, benchmarks. We did that on, on Taurus. And um, while, while starting the tests, we encountered that um, we have this communication pattern here. What do we see? First of all, um, we only see MPI. So each red bar here is an MPI call over time. We don't see any user functions. I disabled them because I was not interested in them. Um, saves me a lot of um, overhead during the simulation time and also produces a lot less data. So that's why I did it. It does not, this is not nice for a commercial presentation because it doesn't look flashy, but that's how it works in reality. So here I basically turned off information I don't want to see. I only wanted to see MPI because that was my first assumption that something must be wrong with MPI. The background was that our simulation ran two times slower when compared to another reference machine that was equipped with the same uh, processor. And I wanted to know why, what's wrong? Why is our system so bad? Um, okay, so what is this? Again, MPI communication over time, roughly 800 seconds. Um, and the pattern looks pretty regular. So actually I would say not that bad. But if I zoom in, I see that there are actually parts that need more time. And from the benchmark itself, I knew that it's totally irregular. So it does over time, over and over the same stuff. And it's very well balanced by definition. So it, there's no reason to think that it is in balance from inside. But apparently MPI behaves strangely over time. And if you look even further uh, into a certain uh, part of the code, here we have roughly um, one to two seconds, you see actually that a great portion behaves nice and there is some part that is slowly, and then there's a, let's say one second of time where it really gets out of hand. So this should actually look like the stuff on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, but it does look as bad as this picture is. So the same work or the same communication needs way more time than before. And the question was, why the heck does this communication need so much time? Another thing that is that strikes me here or that struck me was that, yeah, we have a multitude of processes that are in red, so they are waiting, but there are a few guys like uh, mass, uh, the threat number 20, threat number 16, and threat number 15 that they work, they seem to work just fine. At least there is no MPI waiting time. What does MPI waiting time mean? It basically means these guys are faster than these. So threat 20 is slow at this point in time or imbalanced, you never know. But as I said earlier, I know from the definition of the benchmark, it is balanced. There's no way to think it is not balanced. So why the heck is it that slow so that the others have to wait? First thing I did was I recorded um, CPU cycles for this particular thread. And it turned out because I thought of something external. This must be something external. It cannot come from the application because it doesn't occur all the time. It only occurs every now and then. Actually, it also had a frequency. So it occurred, I think, 10 times a second 
So this made me think of something that comes from the system. And I basically recorded cycles per second. And it turned out that in those phases here, um, the processes were simply not scheduled. And well, when something is not scheduled or at least not scheduled at full speed, uh, it gets slower. And this an HPC application basically makes all the others wait. Um, and looking at more details, this is just underlying this, this assumption. So you see that uh, thread 20 runs basically at half speed because normally it takes from here to there to complete the computation and thread 20 needs almost double the time. And this is happening over and over again. So you see from here to there, that is roughly um, half the time than from here to there. Question was, okay, if it is not scheduled, why is it not scheduled? Because my nodes, they are allocated exclusively. So they only belong to me. There's nothing else running except for the US on this system. Shouldn't happen. Why does it happen nevertheless? Good question. Um, and if you think of HPC, as I said earlier, in many cases, the CPU in this particular case is, is exclusive. So it is really dedicated to my application, except for the operating system that is running aside with it. The memory also, I think, belongs to me because I allocated the node exclusively. The network, that's the tricky thing. Um, that is shared between others. Um, same thing applies to the file system. However, um, in those areas that have half the speed, there was no network activity in my application, also no file system. That leaves it to CPU, GPU activity, if there are no GPUs involved, or to memory. Memory could have been an issue as well. But as I said earlier, I recorded the cycle counters and it turned out that I only got half the cycles. And now the question was actually, um, there must be some noise in the system which, which keeps me from working or keeps my application from doing good work all the time. And yeah, how do I get there now? I mean, how do I understand what, is there something going on on my system? And um, as I said earlier, I allocated those resources exclusively and um, the noise is manifold uh, that can come from the operating system, for example. So it could be some application, some zombie processes still running. It could be some service going on as part of the operating system or as part of the batch system, uh, or even my monitoring itself could be it. Um, it could be the operating system, kernel box and things like that. I'm not kidding because I had kernel box that had um, spinning threads and also killed HPC performance. It could be a broken hardware part, um, or it could be the, even the environment, uh, a rack that gets too, too hot or something like that. So how do I approach that? And at this point, um, I used a tool that is part of, uh, well, inspired by Scopy. It actually writes OTF traces as well. It's um, designed and produced at our site. And it basically does the same thing as Scorp, but for um, the stuff that is happening on the operating system part. So what I do basically here now is I use um, Vampire to look at what's going on on the system. And this is what I see. A very boring picture from reality. Again, nothing flashy. And it basically shows me over time when my application is actually scheduled. So the name of the application is tleaf.base.gn. And I see how it is scheduled on the 24 cores that I had in my system, in my node. So this is no longer MPI or anything like that. This is really how stuff is scheduled on the node. So I see the other side, let's say, of my application or the background of my application. And actually it looks as I would expect it to look. It's 900 seconds and it's always more or less tlib underscore base. So my process obviously runs all the time. Everything is fine. That's what I thought. Before I actually disabled uh, the display of my particular process because you like with functions, I can also turn off 
um, my process here and now the picture changes. So I no longer see that my process is actually scheduled, but I see the other processes and stuff that is scheduled on my system. And what I also see is that I have those strange pink colors here. If you click on them in Vampire, you actually basically see the process that's behind that. And here it showed me a name of a kernel thread. And it was, I was quite surprised by that because that, yeah, simply went through the entire node, obviously. And it looks pretty much like um, the stuff that I, that I observed in my application because I had regions in my application. Um, let me go back to it. That looked very similar. So there were areas where my application wouldn't work, wouldn't do anything. And I think now I know why, because somebody else does something. And the question is, who was it? And even though my note was exclusive, here in this particular case, there was something running in the background. And here you actually see that for a certain um, amount of time, it is quite some substantial disturbance. And you actually see that when you dive in further, it happens at a frequency of roughly um, at 10 times per second or something like that. And it keeps active, I think, uh, for substantial time. And basically, if this happens, my application itself runs at half speed. And this basically leads to an imbalance as shown or as depicted in the vampire charts that I showed for the application itself. And well, um, why is that actually a problem? Because I mean, this is just a single process that, some, that does something in addition. So this should normally harm, not harm anything. But what happens here? Um, ah, by the way, I missed that. Um, the, the reason of that, this, this stuff here was actually, um, a service process that would every now and then run on the system, which was the result of some, some configuration issue that needed to be fixed. So that really came from the system itself. So talking to the administrators, we quickly got to the point where we identified that by means of the name that pops up when you click on that. Okay, but why is this a problem to begin with um, when it comes to performance analysis? Um, it really depends on um, its quantity. If you have a zombie kernel thread that spins at 100%, that means this core is basically not available at all. When it's just a service process with 5% load, that's probably something you can neglect. However, um, it also depends on the noise distribution. So whether it stays on a single thread, on a single core, or whether it went through the entire um, Note, so the multiple cores. And of course, it also depends on your code. Really? That was at least my question. Yes, it does. Because what I observed was that the other HPC benchmarks that I tested, they would just run fine on this system. They don't show almost, they don't, they, they don't show any or almost any degradation in performance. Why is that? I mean, why is one benchmark with such a background process doing very well, and the others, they reduce performance significantly. And the reason for that is pretty simple. In this particular case, it's related to the collective synchronization that is done in this particular benchmark. And it uses uh, a lot of collectives to do that. And what happens in a collective is basically, and this is depicted here, it's, it's like a the typical balance issue in HPC, yeah? So if you have a collective synchronization method, like here, for example, depicted, so um, those parallel processes run into, let's say, a broadcast or a barrier. And if someone is late, and this can only be a single one, all the others have to wait. And this overhead, this waiting time, simply adds up for the amount of parallel processes. So this is really, if you have, a lot of this kind, these kind of methods or 
approaches or synchronization points in your code, they suffer a lot from stuff that has experienced from, from single course that experienced slowdown. And that was the case for this particular example. So removing this service thread by reconfiguring the system, the problem was solved. Um, and this is unfortunately even true for very little noise because if you have, the more cores you have, the more waiting time adds basically. And this multiplies by the number of cores. So that is the pain. So if there is one guy that is uh, waiting, um, the others have to wait. And if somebody is always waiting, um, that's just bad. And you end up in, yeah, halving the performance like in my case. Okay. Um, Good. Let me conclude because we are approaching the end of this presentation. Um, after I fixed the problem, basically um, the picture changed from this picture in the very beginning where we had more than 3000 seconds of waiting time in MPI or reduce to um, a lot less and we could by doing that, reduce the overhead of the MPI communication by almost 10%. So, and this was just a very small service that, that disturbed this application. And of course, this is something in this particular case came from the system, but um, this is something that can happen to you pretty much anywhere in reality. And you would like to know whether it's your fault or whether it is something coming from the outside. And Vampy can also help you there in order to find these kind of issues. And having said that, I would like to complete my presentation with a few questions. So what performance issues have you been related to or what did you see in your past? What is it? that you would expect from tools in that respect? And what are you probably missing overall when you use tools these days? <laughs>